um, repeat some things that I said um, the last time we were together, not the last time, yeah, the last time we were together, I'm gonna pull the slingshot back as it were, as they say in Jamaica, I'm gonna wheel and come again. And what I wanna do, some of the things that Kelvin and they said today, I would in fact kind of say it again because um, it, it, it kind of flows into some of the things that I am doing today. So let me go back to the issue of course correction. And um, <clears throat> I'm gonna kind of um, remind us that um, in 1517, Martin Luther attempted a course correction, pulling things back. Now, by now you understand what we mean by course correction, but um, I'm gonna just kind of bypass some of the other introductory things that I said. But in 1517, Martin Luther attempted a course correction and what we know today as a reformation. Now there are several things inside of Luther's theology. Again, why that theological underpinning is important because while Luther had some very, very, very profound and amazing insight. Luther had some warped areas, some warped theological areas. And more than that, he also had a, a somewhat dysfunctional personality as well. Uh, we don't wanna get into that, but he had some serious personal flaws, some of which would have contributed to, to the whole efforts of 1517 being stalled or being stymied. Most of us are not aware that some of Luther's disposition was very nationalistic in nature. Luther held to very strong nationalistic ideals. It was so strong that history has actually said that Hitler subscribed to a lot of Luther's values in order to do some of the atrocities that he did back in his own day. Luther had some issues, but despite his issues, this guy triggered something that that really had it maintained its trajectory with all of the correct input this thing would have really changed the whole direction of the whole global church or the whole global ecclesia that initiative started with luther identifying 95 reasons why the church is completely off-centered and um, we are aware that he took those 95 theses and he nailed it on wittenberg university notice board and in doing that he literally took the concerns out of the enclave of the religious elite and he put it in the public square. I wanna kind of, um, if you wrote that down or if you put a screenshot of that and you have maybe a tablet or a, a iPad that has a pencil or ways by which you could circle, I want you to kind of underline religious elite and public square. Something that is really very much at the forefront of my own concerns because um, in my own personal studies, in my own personal research, in my trying to discover how best we can really initiate uh, a movement, a transformation, a reformation, and call it by whatever terms, there are several things that are erupting in my mind, and um, some of them really circle around the concept of religious elitism and what I call the public square. So listen to me, why is it important that we take this to the public square? Why is the public square so important? Why is it we need to take this outside of the wonderful enclaves of, of Christianity, the safe enclaves of our little networks? Why is it important that we take it out to the public square? One, it tests the, authentic the authenticity of our work. It also tests the wholeheartedness of our sacrifice outside of the overrated confines of comfort. Why is it we need to take this outside of, our, of the space where we feel most comfortable? When we talk about the public square, it has all kinds of different meanings there, but I really believe that what we've called a move of God in years gone by is something that caters to our own fancy. It is using our own personal calculus to measure what we define as a move of God for ourselves, and it kind of stirs up and moves and shakes up in a little enclave, but it goes no further than that. And this current initiative of God must press beyond the walls of our little churches and our little networks, and it must bleed into humanity where this thing really must work. We must take this beyond the safe confines of our little, little zones. Why do we have to do that? Because in taking it beyond the safety of our own comfort, we are pushing it into a zone where the authenticity of it will be tested the wholeheartedness of our sacrifices will be tested, and that's important. I don't mind that. I really welcome that. Why do we need to take it to the public square? It puts our effort out for scrutiny, and we need that because I think what we've done 
with the current form of Christianity, we don't allow for feedback. We don't allow for engagement. We have a talk shop. One guy talks to us, and it's almost like we've recreated a medieval form of Christianity in a 2020 environment. Back in the days of medievalism, you had a guy standing before an audience speaking in a language that the audience didn't fully understand. People shook their heads in agreement to things that they didn't understand and they went back home and just continued their religious operations. And that doesn't look any different from the model that we currently, that, that we currently incorporate in our operations. We have a guy standing before an audience preaching for two, three hours, and then he dismisses the crowd. And he believes that the, that the power he feels as he ministers is enough to create change. And most of us are still measuring the development of our communities based on what we preach, not necessarily based on how it's understood, based on how it's, how it's captured, based on how it lands, and we don't have any barometer to gauge how, it on, how it's understood, how it's captured, how it lands, because we don't have a system of effective scrutiny. In taking it to the public square, we are putting our efforts out for scrutiny. Next, this is important, in taking it to the public square, it allows us to rebuild a new social capital. Now that's a very important term I want us to capture, to build a new social capital. Hold on to that word because we're gonna get back to it. Taking it to the public square allows us to build a new social capital. It protects us, um, that should be from, it protects us from the carnal desire to build enclaves of insularity. You see, once we continue to build these enclaves of insularity, where we build organizational forms that only cater to our own personal conviction and caters to only our own personal biases and prejudices, that is a safe zone. But we must take this thing beyond the areas, as I've said, the overrated confines of our comfort. Comfort is overrated. In us building new social capital, we must be careful. We must be careful to step outside of building these enclaves of insularity um, in, in, in creating and building new social capital. We have to become more deliberate in becoming less equal. And it is interesting that, that these notes were prepared before I went off to do some uh, medical stuff today. And so I came in and I heard the conversation and I found it kind of really resonated because it had areas in my own presentation I wanted to emphasize. In us building new social capital, it means that we are becoming more deliberate in becoming less unequal, less tribal, less polarized, less socially isolated and more deliberate, deliberately connected. What do I mean? In us taking us to the public square, we are building new social, we are building a new social capital. We are refusing to, bin, to build enclaves of insularity. That's how most, excuse me to, if I use this term, because I know some of you here are members of networks. <laughs> some of you have networks on your own. I, I don't want this to sound as though I'm, I'm attacking your organization, but I want you to understand that most networks that have, that have emerged over the world in the, in the last 10, 15 years, they've literally become enclaves of insularity. But what we have to do, we have to become deliberate. Please hear me, guys, because there is no move of God that we can effect that is global in nature if we continue to live on a, on a little, in a little insulated space, spaces. In us building a new social capital, we must become more deliberate in being less unequal, less tribal, less polarized, less socially isolated, and more deliberately connected. If that could only kind of um, really settle in your heart as a revelation, then we have some serious ground that we could build with. If this could settle in your heart, the determination for us to become really less unequal, less tribal, less polarized, less socially isolated and more connected. It's, it's our effort to build a new anti-elite. That's a very important term. It's our effort to build a new anti-elite by including and making room for all and everyone. What we have done, we have basically recruited people into our orbits and tried in every which way to make them like ourselves. And if they don't become like ourselves, we either condemn them as being rebellious or we kick them out. And what we've done, we've built on the Babylonian model. Babylon and Egypt was built with bricks. 
all the bricks basically were fitted into a mold, were built by a mold and held together by a synthetic material. And we've built like that. We've asked people to look very much like us, sing the same songs, preach the same way, jump the same way, behave the same way. And if at all you don't, then you are considered almost like an enemy of our structure because we have built the wrong ways. And when our little enclave have a little, have a little spasm, we call it a move of God. That's a spasm. You have a little shake, a little shiver. In order for a move of God to be legitimately a move of God, it cannot be subject to some little isolated area among a, among a sprinkled few. A move of God, it goes beyond barriers. It goes beyond tribes. It goes beyond people groups. It is global in nature. And if we have to effect a true move of God, we must be deliberate to break, must be able to break this elite system and build an anti-elite model by including and making room for all and everyone. We must be deliberate in terminating the Nicolaitan spirit. Removing, listen to me, we have to be deliberate. We have to remove the great gulf between the entrenched elite and the marooned underclass and create a new murmuration. Let me say that again, because it's important. We must be deliberate in terminating the Nicolaitan spirit. That Nicolaitan spirit, we all know what it is. It is the gap between the haves and the have-nots. It is the gap between the, the clergy and the laity. It is the great gap between those who know and those who don't know. It is the gap between those who live in urban areas and those who live in the ghettos. It is the gap between those who live in the trenches versus those who live in tent houses. That gap, we must be deliberate in terminating the Nicolaitan spirit, removing the great gulf between the entrenched elite and the marooned underclass and create a new murmuration. This is, this is, this, this is, this is um, very, very important for us as we build. And I'm really trying to make this clear and real to you. And I really want to encourage you maybe to go back and listen to this. Listen to this. I'm going to push these notes out but you could go back and examine these principles because they're important. Now you see that word there, murmuration? Some of you, it might be a new term. Let's talk about murmuration for a little bit. And in order for us to talk about it, let me show you a video. Let me show you what a murmuration is. And in doing this, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions after. Maybe at the end of looking at the little video, I want you to tell me what you see, what you see. And I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. And guys, let's... um. Let's get the questions or the comments um, popping, all right? So let's see what I call a murmuration. What is a murmuration? And before I get back to it, let me read this important point. This issue of building a new social capital. We have to be deliberate in terminating the Nicolaitan spirit, removing the gap between, the great gulf between the entrenched elite the apostles and the prophets and the man of God and the, and the reverend and the bishop, the entrenched elite. Most of us still read Ephesians chapter 4 inaccurately because in reading Ephesians chapter 4, you still see these two classes because what we read is this, and God gave some apostles and prophets and teachers, evangelists and pastors for the perfecting of the saints. And what you see is fivefold and saints, fivefold and saints. And we did not read the rest of it until we all come. In other words, as long as the gap exists between the two and we don't arrive at we all becoming, then we're missing the mark. God is not interested in fivefold and laity. What he's interested in, in, in all of us becoming. Fivefold losing themselves into sainthood and sainthood losing themselves into fivefold. We must arrive at we all become. And so we have to remove the gulf between the entrenched elite and the marooned and the class and create a new murmuration. This is what a murmuration looks like. Look at this and tell me what you see.
I think we can stop there, guys. <laughs> we can stop right there. We can go on and on. What do you see? Tell me. I want to open up the lines. What do you see there? Remember, I said we have to move towards what we call a new murmuration. What do you see? Anybody wants to be the first to describe for me what you see there? 